right, well, let's continue on and um, finish off the Beatitudes before we go to bed. Wouldn't that be great? A few summers ago, my husband encouraged me to read a book called uh, Light from Old Times by J.C. Ryle. And I remember as I read that, it was a very sober read because it was recounting the martyrs that were burned at the stake uh, during the 15, 19, uh, or 1500s during the reign of Queen Mary. And many of them were beaten and tortured uh, for preaching the gospel. Uh, for many, the fires would go out and then they would have to be relit while their arms and legs were falling off. Uh, many of their wives and their children would uh, watch their dad or their husband be burned at the stake. And I was convicted as I read things like this. Rogers went to death as if he was walking to his wedding. Another one talks about being burned and there was a man next to him. His name was Leaf. And he said, be of good comfort, brother. We're going to have a merry supper with the Lord this night. And that was in the 1500s. And um, ladies, even in our day, I don't know if you know this, but there are many men and women who are killed for their faith. In fact, do you know in the last decade, over 900,000 Christians have been murdered? 900,000. 60,000 in 2016. One pastor in Romania, recent recalled this being in solitary confinement with chunks of his flesh being cut from his body and he was given no food and yet in the midst of all this he recounts that the joy of the lord would so overtake him that he would dance with joy in his prison now ladies to us these things that happened in the 1500s and this one from romania was more recent it might sound a little weird a little foreign but do you know in a short time from now, it might not sound so foreign, but very commonplace for those of us who are God's children? Some of us in this room may be persecuted and, yes, even killed for righteousness sake. In fact, I've noticed throughout the years that I've been speaking in the last few years, several have become more angry with me. And one lady even got physical with me last year. In fact, my daughter says, Mom, you're going to be killed on one of these trips. But even so, whatever. You know, some of us may. Some of us may be persecuted. Some of us may be killed for righteousness' sake. And did you know this is one of the eight blessed Beatitudes that Christ taught on the Sermon on the Mount? Maybe it's not your favorite. But for the genuine kingdom citizen, it's as cherished as much much as the other seven. So let's consider them together. And we'll just read Matthew 5, 7 to 13 since we already covered the first six verses. Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven and so persecuted they the prophets who are or were before you now we had the first four blessed beatitudes in the last lesson and this one we're going to continue on with four more now just a reminder because i know you've had some food and i don't know what else you did in those 10 minutes but just a reminder we saw the first three beginning blessings They all started with S. Jesus sat down, and he well, first he saw the multitudes, he sat down, and then he spoke. Then we looked at the first four Beatitudes, and we remember we learned that they are listed in a proper order in the sense that once we realize our destitute state of being poor in spirit results in our mourning over our sin, which leads us to an attitude of humility, and in our humility we realize how desperate we are that we so much so that we hunger and thirst for all the righteousness that there is. And ladies, these fir- the first four Beatitudes that we looked in the last lesson refer to our relationship with God. And the last four that we're going to be looking at in this session speak of our relationship to one another. So let's begin with the first one. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So he now moves to the fifth one. And remember, this has to do with our relationship with each other. Jesus says, those who are happy or fortunate are those who are merciful. Now, what does it mean to be merciful? 
Well, it actually means someone who shows compity or passion. It actually refers to a woman uh, who is pregnant that is in labor or in severe pain. Um, in other words, those who are merciful, they enter into the pains of others. In fact, they endeavor to alleviate their sufferings if they can. And ladies, again, we need to remind ourselves, Jesus is not describing something we hope to be. He's describing a genuine Christian, a kingdom citizen. And ladies, this is not new. The age old apostle John says this, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother has a need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwells the love of God in him? In other words, it doesn't. How can we go and we see someone who's destitute, naked of daily food, and we don't show any compassion or mercy? In fact, that's what James says. What is the prophet, my brother, if a man says he has faith and has not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and you say, "Ah, I'll pray for your brother, go in peace. And we don't give him the things that are needful for the body. What does it profit? Faith without works is dead. Listen, James, Jesus, John, they all say the same thing. If you harden your heart to the needs of others, ladies, don't fool yourself. Your faith is dead. It's dead. It's empty. Now, this mercy, when Jesus says blessed are the merciful, he's not only talking about having that bowels of compassion for others that leads us to alleviate their pain and their misery, but he also is referring to extending forgiveness to those who have offended us. And ladies, this is something that is sorely lacking in the church today. Again, uh, just recently, another church in my hometown, and there's so much going on, and 500 members have left, and there's so much unforgiveness and bitterness and hatred. Should not be. I don't read about that in the pages of the New Testament, that that's acceptable for a genuine kingdom citizen. But ladies, think about it. If the first four Beatitudes are in place in your life, if you're poor in spirit, If you mourn over your sin, if you're humble, if you're hungering and thirsting for all the righteousness there is, then you're going to show mercy, right? Why? Because you've been extended mercy, right? God has shown mercy on you. He's forgiven you. He comforts you when you sin. He consoles you. How can you not forgive another person? How can you not show mercy to someone who needs your help? How can we not do that? We should have no problem forgiving others or showing mercy to others. Why? Because we are the forgiven ones, right? We've been shown mercy, right? Well, Jesus goes on to say those who show mercy will obtain mercy, which means they will obtain compassion by divine grace. In fact, the Greek word here is a bit different in that it refers to God's divine compassion for us, whereas the first one referred to our human compassion towards each other. Ladies, Jesus is clear, and we won't get to it this weekend, but in Matthew 6, when he's talking about praying, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your trespasses. In fact, James says, if you show no mercy, you will be shown no mercy. And the greater context is your salvation. If you can't extend mercy in this life, don't expect to be shown mercy when you stand before God. It's a greater context there. Ladies, Jesus, James, saying the same thing. If you show no mercy, you'll be granted no mercy. Now, ladies, this would have shocked the Jewish audience because, you know, they didn't, they weren't about to show mercy to anybody. In fact, remember, Jesus rebukes them in Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay tithe of men, Annas and company, omitted the weightier matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faith, right? Oh, they, you know, pay their tithe. They do everything. They come to church on Sunday morning. They put 10% in the offering plate. They sing in the choir. They do everything. But they go out those church doors. They see someone that needs their help. Someone needs forgiveness. Are you kidding? I'm not going to do that. In fact, Jesus says, these ought you have done and left the other undone. 
That's pretty shocking. You'll need to tithe. You need to go, what? <laughs> Show mercy to someone. In fact, he calls them blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. <laughs> Ladies, many of us today, we do the, all the outward religious requirements, but we show no mercy. We who profess Christ and remain insensitive to the needs of others are headed for eternal damnation. That's what Jesus says. But what did Matt, Micah 6, 8 say? He has shown you, O oh man, what does the Lord require of you? You want to know what the Lord requires of you? To do justly, to love mercy? And to walk humbly with your God. That's what he requires of you. Simple, isn't it? Ladies, are you merciful? Do you forgive others for the wrongs that they have done towards you? Do you hold grudges? Are you reaching out to those who are less fortunate than you are? Well, Jesus continues on with the sixth beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Again, those who are pure in heart are blessed. And pure means to be holy, to be free from every taint of evil. In fact, it has the idea of being single-focused, having a single heart, not divided in your devotion. In fact, James says the same thing. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart, you double-minded. Be single-focused, single-minded. In fact, the psalmist knew this to be true too. Psalm 24, 3 says, Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his place? He who has clean hands, a pure heart, he who has not lifted his soul up to idols... Ladies, the psalmist knew what you should know. Without purity of heart, you won't be able to worship the Lord. Can't do it. Can't do it. Now you might be saying, Susan, how does this relate to my relationship with others? It does. You know why? The inward will manifest itself in the outward, right? The inward manifests itself in the outward. In fact, Jesus put it well in Matthew 15, 19, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, blasphemies. Those are the things that defile a man, right? What comes out of your heart. Ladies, when your heart is pure, it will manifest itself in having thoughts, feelings, emotions, and actions that are pure, right? So you could ask yourself questions like this. What are my motives in doing this or saying this? Is it for the Lord? Is it for me? Is it pure? Am I trying to please men? Am I trying to please God? Ladies, if your heart is clean, if your heart is pure, your life will be clean. Your actions will be clean. Well, the wonderful joy of those who are pure in heart, notice what Jesus says, they will see God. In fact, the word see means to gaze with wide eyes open. <laughs> now, maybe you're saying, wait a minute, Susan, you don't know your Bible very well because John says no man has seen God at any time, right? The only begotten son in the bosom of the father, he's declared it. No one has seen God. So wait a minute, how, if I'm pure in heart, how am I going to see God? Well, ladies, God can be seen in the person of his son, Jesus, right? In fact, do you know we see God now in the sense that we see him through this book right here? Read it, ladies. It's great. It's wonderful. 66 letters. We can see God right now through his word, through creation. But seeing him face to face is something that's not going to transpire until what? Glory. In fact, 1 John says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And listen to this. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Interesting. John says the same thing. Those that are pure in heart will what? See God. That's what Jesus says, right? The pure in heart will what? See God. John says it too. Isn't it funny how the Bible all relates to each other? You know, Debbie and I were talking this afternoon about something, and I said, but the whole Bible talks about it. He said, look at the whole Bible. It all comes together. One man says this, if we grasp this, it would revolutionize our lives. You and I are meant for the audience chamber of God. 
You and I are being prepared to enter into the presence of the King of Kings. Do you believe it? Do you know it's as true? Do you realize the day is coming when you're going to see the blessed God face to face? Not as in a glass darkly, but face to face. Surely the moment we grasp this, everything else pales into insignificance. You and I are going to enjoy God and to spend our eternity in his glorious and eternal presence. End of quote. Ladies, do you realize that? We're going to see him. Now listen, for the prideful Jew, the person sitting on that slope, (laughs) the Pharisee, the hypocrite, this beatitude would be bleak. Why? Because they prided themselves in the outward rituals, washing their hands and cleaning the cups. They didn't know anything about an inward cleansing of the heart. But ladies, Jesus tells them their hearts are revealed in what they think. And ladies, it is for us too. In fact, Jesus says, why do you think evil in your hearts? Why do you think evil in your hearts? In fact, he calls them brood of vipers. How can you being evil speak good things? You can't, right? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In fact, I've often thought about that when I'm around people and now some of the stuff that comes out of their mouth. And I'm like, ah, out of the abundance of what? The heart. What's coming out of their mouth is what's in their heart. In fact, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. And you know what Jesus says? I say to you, every idle word that men will speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment. By your word, you'll be justified or by your word, you'll be condemned. But ladies, what comes out of our mouth is what's in our heart. Well, what about your heart? Is it pure? Maybe you're saying, Susan, I don't know if it's pure. I really don't. Well, it's a, I think it's an easy way to find out. You know how? What about your thoughts? Are they pure? Your words? What about the 18,000 words you've spoken today? They say the average person speaks 18,000 words a day. What have, if, if you were to have written a book about your 18,000 words a day and I'd get up and get up tonight and read it before I send all of you home, what would those 18,000 words look like? That tells us a lot about our purity, doesn't it? Our actions. What have you done today? What'd you do today? That tells a lot about our life. If it's pure. Ladies, those things, your actions, your words, your thoughts that you've had today, that gives indication of the condition of your heart. If it's pure or not. Well, Jesus moves on to the seventh beatitude, the one of being a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Happy are those who make peace. Now, ladies, being a peacemaker would be the natural result of those who are poor in spirit, mourning over their sin, who are meek, hungering and thirsting for all the righteousness there is. They're showing mercy. They have a pure heart. They're reacting to others from a pure heart. Why do you say that, Susan? Ladies, when you see yourself in light of God's holiness and and you start acting on it, then you aren't interested in stirring up trouble. You don't want to be a troublemaker. You want to be a peacemaker. Ladies, when you realize your own depravity of your heart and where you've come from, you don't want to stir up conflict. You want to solve it, right? In fact, Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Ladies, one who is a peacemaker strives to solve conflicts, not start them. They want unity. In fact, they also want others to be at peace, and so they pursue peace. And they hold others accountable to be peaceful. In fact, when people come to me with problems about others, I'll tell, ask them, have you gone to that person? And if they haven't gone to that person, I hold them accountable to go to that person. And my husband, as I've told you before, takes it a step further. He says, let's get in my car right now and you can go to that person and tell them what you just told me. And that stops a lot of that. Peacemaker, not a troublemaker, a peacemaker. Isn't it interesting that purity of heart came before peacemaking? You might say, why is that interesting? You know what James says? The wisdom that comes from above is what? First, pure. Then peaceable, right? Then gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. 
Ladies, you can't have peace without purity. Can't have it. Purity comes before peace. In fact, impurity breeds breeds strife, right? That's what James says in James 3. If you have bitter envy and strife in your heart, do not glory and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not sin from above. What? It's, It's earthly. It's sensual. It's demonical. It's of the devil. In fact, he says where envy and strife is, there is all kinds of confusion and every evil thing. In fact, Paul says, pursue peace and holiness without which no man will see the Lord. Pursue peace and holiness without which no man, no woman will see the Lord. Now, I want to be clear. This does not mean that I pursue peace at the expense of the purity of the truth of God's word. Okay? Never do you pursue peace without sound doctrine. Jesus says, do not think I came to be bring peace on the earth. I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. And he goes on to say, what? A man's enemies will be they of his own household. He talks about a man being against his father, a father against a daughter, a daughter against a daughter-in-law. And he says, man's enemies will be they of his own household. In fact, he goes on to say, if you love father, mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. And so, ladies, sometimes peace is impossible, even though we might try very hard to be a peacemaker. And that's why I think we can take comfort in what Paul says, as much as is possible, live peaceably with all men. And I've lived long enough now to know that there are some people who do not want to be at peace with you, even though you try very hard to do the right thing biblically and follow the steps in Matthew 18 or whatever to go, go, go and pursue peace. Well, the good news is that if we are peacemakers, notice what Jesus says, you're going to be called a son of God. A son of God. Son is a word which means a relationship of a child to a parent. And ladies, since God is the God of all peace, then it makes sense his children would exhibit peace as well, right? Ladies, are you a troublemaker? Do people run when they see you coming Or avoid your calls because they know you're going to stir up strife. You know, as a pastor's wife, there are certain people, I I try to love them all, but I remember not the church my husband's pastoring now, but the one before this, and every time I saw a certain woman on my caller ID, I dreaded answering the phone. You know why? Because every single time she had a complaint. Without fail. Without fail. That's what a terrible indictment on her. Ladies, do people avoid you? They avoid your phone calls. They know you're a troublemaker. Or do you look for ways to make peace and bring peace? Well, Jesus finishes the Beatitudes with the eighth one. And this one would be perhaps the most shocking of all. Not only to the audience that is sitting there at his feet, but even to us now. Those of us in this room tonight that are listening to these words. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And anybody would say, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Jesus just said I should be a peacemaker. And yet now I'm going to be persecuted for doing what's right? Yep, that's right. Didn't that make you happy? Now, ladies, maybe this is a beatitude that you wish for wasn't in the Bible, but it is, and it's just as important as the other seven. And may I say this, it's also a principle that has pushed many a nominal Christian to leave the faith they thought they once possessed. But Jesus warned of that, right? The parable of the sowers, Matthew 13. Remember the the parable of the sowers, the seed that was sown on stony ground, received it with joy immediately. Hey, this is great. But when tribulation and persecution came, what? I'm out of (laughs) here. I'm out of here. Hey, I love this. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. But this persecution stuff, are you kidding me? I didn't sign up for that. I'm out of here. But Jesus says, no, you're happy if you're persecuted. You're happy. It's a good thing. In fact, the word persecution means to pursue, to chase, to drive away. And ladies, notice why we're persecuted. Because of righteousness. Because of doing what is right. Ladies, think about it. Think very carefully. If you're hungering and thirsting for all the righteousness there is, and if you're practicing righteousness, 
then what's going to be the result? You're going to be persecuted for righteousness sake, right? Those who hunger and thirst for all the righteousness will stand out as very strange to those who are in the world, right? And even in the church. In fact, my sister that just moved to Oklahoma, she's not a believer, neither is her husband. And she said to me recently, Andy thinks you're crazy. And I go, well, I guess I am. I mean, I'm sure I am crazy. Because you stand out as a, a looney tune, right? To the lost. And I'm afraid we even stand out as looney tunes to some people in our own churches, right? As Debbie got the text the other day, you're just too zealous. That's what's wrong with you and your religion. You're too zealous. Ladies, Peter reiterates this to the Christians in 1 Peter. If you're reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. Why? For the spirit and glory of God rests upon you. The Shekinah glory rests upon you if you're persecuted for Christ's sake. You know, some of us suffer because of our own sin, right? But suffering for doing what's right, that's good, right? In fact, Peter says, don't anybody suffer as a murderer, a thief, or a busybody in other people's matters. But if you suffer for doing what's right, that's a good thing. In fact, my friend that I just mentioned in the last lesson, she has said to me, Susan, you'll never regret doing what's right you'll always regret doing what's wrong but you'll never regret doing what's right in fact peter says it's better if it's the will of god to suffer for doing what's good than doing what's evil right paul says in philippians it is be given on you on behalf of christ not only to believe on him but to what suffer suffer for his sake now ladies i know that suffering is not on your birthday list this year but paul says it's a gift You know, I think that's why we have so many apathetic Christians in the church today. We do not see suffering as a gift, as a means to growing in Christ's likeness. We shrink from suffering. We don't want to be persecuted. We don't want to be hated for being a Christian. And so we coil. But ladies, Jesus even tells his disciples before going to the upper room, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you, right? If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, therefore the world, what, hates you. They hate you. Ladies, we, when we are persecuted, when we act like Christ, people hate that. In fact, Jesus will even say later on in the upper room, the time is going to come that whoever kills you will think they're doing God a service. Whoever kills you will think they're doing God a service. Well, the glorious benefit is those who are persecuted are not only happy, but notice what Jesus says. Theirs and theirs alone is the kingdom of heaven. Ladies, the first beatitude ended with this as well. Remember the first beatitude we looked at? Theirs and theirs alone is the kingdom of heaven. And now Jesus ends with the last beatitude. Theirs and theirs alone is the kingdom of heaven. However, he expounds on this beatitude a little bit more. And ladies, maybe because we need it, because we are in an age that could incur a lot of persecution, but also many Christians don't like this beatitude. They don't want to be persecuted for righteousness. But notice what he says. Blessed are you when men revile you, persecute you, say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. In fact, it's interesting. Jesus mentions that we are blessed twice. Two times he mentions it. Why? He's emphasizing this because it would be a shocking statement to the Jew. And it's a shocking statement to many of you. Why? Many consider prosperity a blessing. Right? Not suffering. Suffering is a blessing? Are you kidding me? In fact, that's the massive heresy of our day, right? The prosperity gospel. Jesus died to make me healthy. Jesus died to make me happy. No, Jesus died to make me holy. Holy. Well, Jesus says this persecution will be manifested by reviling and saying all kinds of evil. What's reviling? Well, it would be insulting you, rebuking you to your face. (laughs) I had that happen last year. We had a woman take me outside. In fact, she said, I want to talk to you outside. I was like, okay. So out we went and she began to do just this in my face and shaking me and Saying all kinds of interesting things. That's what Jesus is saying. They'll say all kinds of hurtful evil 
malicious things, things that are not true. Do you know Jesus himself was called crazy? He is crazy. He has a demon. He's not so. <laughs> Ladies, Jesus emphasizes here it's for his sake because we live righteously. Ladies, it's because you belong to God. It's because you're his child that you're persecuted, that you're hated. Do you know it's a privilege to suffer for the Lord? Do you know it's a privilege? I remember the first time I was exposed to this. I hadn't been a Christian very long, and my husband was preaching at the church he grew up in. It had become a quite a seeker-friendly church, but he had been asked to do Mother's Day message, and he spoke on Titus 2, and it was a church of about 2,000 people, and <clears throat> after the message was over, and they're supposed to come up and greet us, and <clears throat> maybe about six people came up. I mean, nobody, they all vacated pretty quick. But this one lady came up to him, and she said, oh, I hate you, and I hate that message. And I was like, yay. I was like, okay. And I remember I couldn't wait to get to the car, and I said, oh, my. And he goes, wasn't that great? And I go, no. <laughs> and he goes, great, we got to suffer for Jesus. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe I don't want to do this after all, but... <clears throat> It's a privilege to suffer for him. In fact, you know, Paul says, I want to fill up that which is lacking in my sufferings. Paul says, I haven't suffered enough. I want to fill up that which is lacking in my sufferings. I want to identify with the Lord so much and look so much like Jesus that I want to suffer. And ladies, if this is not shocking enough, Jesus finishes with telling what our attitude should be when we do suffer. Kind of like my husband's. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad. Great is your reward in heaven. They also persecuted the prophets who were before you. So instead of retaliating against those who persecute us, we rejoice. Instead of resenting them, we rejoice. Ladies, this is where we practice that mercy beatitude, by the way, right? You might say, well, how do we do this? How do we do this? Peter tells us how to do it. He says, for this were you called because Christ suffered for us, leaving in us an example that we should follow in his steps who did no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile back. When he was threatened, he didn't threaten back. What did he do? He committed himself to the one who judges righteously. I remember last year when this woman took me outside, and I know she's going to take me out. I know what was going to happen. Debbie was inside at the book table, and I thought, man, I guess I'm going out. And uh, I, I thought, okay, don't retaliate, Susan. Try to defuse this situation. It's hard. And pray. You know, commit yourself to the one who judges righteously. It's hard. But you can do it, ladies, by the power of the Spirit that lives within you. Now, notice the two responses we're to have here. Rejoice, which means be cheerful, calmly happy. <laughs> you know, that's what the apostles did when they were beaten for sharing the gospel in Acts 5. It says after they were beaten, they departed from the presence of the Lord, counting it what? Worthy. They, it was glorious that they got to be what? Beaten for the Lord's sake. Suffer shame for his name. Secondly, Jesus says we're to be exceedingly glad, which means leap for joy. <laughs> Leap for joy. You might say, Susan, why should I have these attitudes? Are you kidding me? Notice what Jesus says. The first reason you should have this attitude, because great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. My friend, you're not only going to inherit the kingdom of heaven, but you're going to have a great reward. And you might say, well, what's that reward? I want to see if it's worth it. I don't know. But you know what Paul says? Eye has not seen nor ear has heard what God has prepared for those of us who love him. You know, my husband thinks when we get to heaven, the first response is going to be laughter. Why did I hold on to this? Are you kidding me? When I can have this? Are you kidding me? So eye has not seen. I don't know what that reward is, but great is your reward in heaven. So ladies, if you're being persecuted tonight, take joy in that. I don't know what reward God has for you, but it's going to be great. Jesus says, mega, man, it's going to be great. And secondly, you can have this attitude because you're not the first one to suffer. I know some of you in here think you are. Woe is you. You know, I'm the only one going through this problem. No, there's no temptation, but such as is common to man, right? But do you know others suffered before you? Think about it. Moses, Samuel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Nehemiah, Stephen, Peter, Paul, James, and many others persecuted because of their faith. So you're in good company. In fact, if you read Hebrews 11, you give a 
You have a chilling summary, don't you, of those who were persecuted? Scourgings, mockings, chains, imprisonment, sawn in half. Now, I just thought I was going to be beat up last year, but I guess the lady pulled out her saw and started to saw me in two. That would be a little interesting. Stoning, wandering about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. And why did they do this? They were looking for a better country, a heavenly country. Jesus says, listen very carefully, woe to you if all men speak well of you. Ladies, that should cause you to pause. If you're everybody's best bud and nobody ever speaks evil of you, woe to you. Woe to you if all men speak well of you. Why? For so did their fathers to the false prophets. Ladies, Jesus was not seeker friendly, was he? And neither should we be. It is said that Charles Haddon Spurgeon's wife took these eight Beatitudes and wrote them on a piece of paper and put them on their ceiling. So when he would go to bed at night and wake up in the morning, he would read them. She did not want him to forget the persecution that he was enduring, that it was because of his righteous life, if you know anything about Charles Haddon Spurgeon. It was probably persecution that killed him, really, if you read about it. What a great wife she was. In fact, Job's wife needed a lesson from her, right? Ladies, are you being persecuted because you belong to Christ? If you're not suffering for Christ's sake, then maybe you're not living a righteous life that would incur suffering. Paul is very clear, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. Will suffer, that is a promise. You will suffer persecution. Well, as we close, what a great beginning to this sermon. Eight blessed beatitudes that should possess every child of God. Do they possess you? Do they describe you? You know, what's so interesting about these eight Beatitudes, besides the fact they build on one another, is, listen very carefully, the first four that we saw in the last lesson are fleshed out in the last four. For example, being poor in spirit leads me to being merciful. Mourning over my sin leads me to purity of heart. Being meek leads me to being a peacemaker. And hungering and thirsting for all the righteousness there is leads me to being persecuted for righteousness' sake. (laughs) Ladies, these eight blessed beatitudes are blessed for those who know God, but for those who are hypocrites, they will not consider these beatitudes as blessed, but burdens they can't possibly attain. But ladies, they are foundational to the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. The next three lessons that we'll hear tomorrow... The Christian's impact on the world, living out the golden rule, and even the very last message is foundational to the Sermon on the Mount. But in closing, if these eight blessed Beatitudes do not describe you, then may I say in all sincerity you need to do some serious self-examination. Make sure you fully understand the gospel, not the cheap gospel of our day, okay, but the real gospel. The gospel that Jesus preached. Repent. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's pray. Again, Lord, I just want to give thanks to you for the beginning of this precious sermon. Powerful. Thank you for preserving it for us. Thank you for loving us enough to call us out of darkness and to transfer us into the kingdom of the Son that you love. Thank you that we are happy, we are fortunate when we live out these Beatitudes. And Lord, they should describe every one of us in this room. And I pray that each of us, before we go to bed tonight, would ask ourselves if we are pure in heart, if we are meek, if we are suffering for righteousness. 
that we would examine ourselves in light of these eight blessed beatitudes. And Lord, if they don't describe us, then we would mourn and weep over our sin. And we would humble ourselves before you and realize our desperateness and how desperate we are in need of a Savior. I do pray for these ladies. I know that many of them have some traveling to do. I pray that you would guide them safely home, bring us back tomorrow for another great time in your word. We do thank you for the word, Lord. It is the joy and rejoicing of our heart because we're called by your name. May we eat your words this weekend, and may they be like honey to our soul. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 